it's not. Um, so it's a little further. I do live in London, though. And it's, uh, it's always a great thrill for me. Why are you wearing a Zimbabwe top? Zimbabwe. <laughs> are you really? <laughs> Is that a rugby top? Yeah. Rugby sevens. 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 You didn't play, did you? No, I didn't play at sevens. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get a jersey? Did you think it? Uh, no, I was doing one team. You, were you in Dubai? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we sort of just chatted. Away. <laughs> so, what's your name? Uh, Andrew Cumming. Andrew Cumming? Yeah, it's what Are you the son of a Cumming? Yeah. <laughs> I know you are, but what are the Cummings? The Cummings, you coached the Falcon. No, William Cumming. Um, Lorne Bowles played the Cumming game. Really? <laughs> <laughs>
but we call them pata patas in Africa because of the sound you make. I think it's a very sensible name. Anyway, I was running with flip flops, right? And I was racing my brother. He was two years older than me, remember, so he was much bigger, much taller, and stronger. And I beat him to the ice cream man. And when we got to the ice cream man, he said, Boy, you're fast. And I suppose that he was the first person who affirmed a, a, a talent in me. How many of you think that's important? It's important, isn't it? When you're great, you're little, you need someone to say, Hey, you're really good at this, or wow, you, you know, you're a good artist, or you're a good dancer, ballerina, whatever. And so for me, that was very important because it gave me a, a direction, something to live for, something to dream for. And it was also in the mid-80s when uh, the heroes of our day were the athletes that you guys would never have heard of, unless you'd, you'd done sports history, I suppose. But there was a guy called Carl Lewis. Anyone heard of Carl Lewis? There was a guy, there was a guy called uh, Danny Thompson, and there was a, guy called Fat, a girl called Fatima Woodred, um, and uh, she was uh, a javelin thrower. And these were the heroes of our day. I mean, nowadays you guys have different heroes. You've got, uh, what's it, Usain Bolt, is that right? Or was it Richard Branson? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, those were the heroes of the day. We wanted to, to run like them. And, and so I was a long jumper, and I used to do the 100 meters. I used to do the 200 meters, and, and I started to have success. The other thing that made me realize I was fast running was I was walking around the corner one day, and I heard a rustling sound to my left as I went around the corner. There was dust and then leaves and stuff. And of course, in Zimbabwe, if you hear a rustic sound to your left, you look very quickly. In England, you probably don't. I mean, it could be a rat or a mole, or perhaps, what, a badger? That's the, probably the worst you could get. In Africa, it could be a lion or an elephant or a leopard. So I turned around very quickly, and I saw uh, this African spitting cobra, just about a strike. I must have been about eight. And this thing was as high as me, looking me in the eye. Now, listen, when you're young, everything looks bigger, doesn't it? I'm sure some of you have gone to junior school, and that lady who you thought was a monster, all of a sudden you realise it's actually just a midget, right? You know, everything, everything looked bigger, so the snake looked huge. But all I remember is about 10 seconds later, I was 200 metres away. So if you said Bolt had raised me that day, I'm sure I won. <laughs> so I realised I can run. And obviously if you can run, you're pretty useful in most sports. I'm talking proper sports, by the way, I'm not talking... You know, these things called sports in inverted commas, like darts. <laughs> or lawn darts. I mean, it's darts. Come on. do rugby and football. You know, they put you on the wing because you can run and you can get past defenders. That's what you And so, it so it was, I found another sport. Uh, all sports. Uh, rugby, football, tennis. I wasn't necessarily good at uh, all of them, but, but I, I loved it. And the African sort of outdoors. Uh, lifestyle enables you to enjoy the sun and get out. And we don't get to drab, overcast, drizzly days, do we? So it's a very good opportunity for a young man or a young girl to, to really you know, explore various sports. It was also compulsory in our schools, so you had to do it. But I fell in love with uh, primary athletics, but cricket it was a sport that I sort of stumbled upon. There was a coach who came out to Zimbabwe. His name was Bob Blair. He played for New Zealand in the 50s and 60s. can't remember. And uh, he was going around schools in Zimbabwe holding these special clinics and teaching kids how to hold a bat, hold a ball, to how to swing it, and all that sort of stuff. And um, I basically called the bug, he explained the sport to me, and I sort of understood it, and, and it became interesting. Uh, how many of you understand that you've got to understand the rules of cricket to appreciate it? You, you can't really enjoy it if you don't know the rules. Uh, are you with me? I mean, that makes sense, right? Uh, it's a very complicated sport, and it's hard to explain. I, mean, I tried to explain it once to an American. <laughs> and uh, um, they, they, they didn't get it, but they made a very poignant point. They said, uh, you know, I can understand that it's an exciting game, but I can't understand how you can play for five days and not have a winner. <laughs> they kind of had a point, but the thing is, cricket is very complicated. You've got these nuances, you've got battles within battles, you've got a bowl against the batsman, that sort of thing. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed that more so over sports like football. I mean, football's... It's not a thinking man's game, is it, right? <laughs> Wayne Rooney can play football, right? <laughs> Wait, there's the ball, put in the goal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love the, the nuances in cricket, so, so I, I, I gravitated towards it more and more over the years. And uh, long story short, I started to play, I, I got picked for the Zimbabwe school sides uh, at the age of 12 and also the rugby side. So, there was a little bit of promise, I suppose, from young age that there was potential to, in sport. But, but alongside it, I was also interested in other things like, like singing, music. Uh, we used to do these horrible plays in Zimbabwe, these old-fashioned operatas like Gilbert and Sullivan stuff. You guys heard of those kinds of plays, you know? So it was actually an interest of mine in Form 1. I went to 
to the auditions, because I've always been left out of all the plays in my junior school, every single one, including the sound of music. You have got to be better to be left out of the sound of music. You know? <laughs> so I got into high school, I thought, okay, I, I'm going to sort this out. I'm gonna, I went to the auditions, there was a lady there, Felix Rusted, she was auditioning all the boys, and she'd been at the school for something like uh, 30 years by the time I arrived. And she made us all stand up and sing as a group, and then sing as individuals, and offline bands. And I thought I'd done a pretty good job in my own humble opinion, if I may say so. Um, uh, and then I went to the notice board the next day to see if I'd been chosen, and of course, lo and behold, the first thing that wiped the smile off my face was realizing that we were doing a play called Oklahoma. I don't know if you've heard of Oklahoma, but it ain't a cool play. It's not like Greece or something. It's just not cool. So, I, the, thing, the second thing that wiped the smile off my face was I realized I'd been cast as a girl. You know, <laughs> <laughs> See, in a boys only school, you've got to find the girls from summer, so it's all the youngsters with high pitched voices. Now, if you look at me, I don't think I'm particularly gifted in the feminine looking state. <laughs> so, um, to say that I looked like a girl is an overstatement. I mean, I, they had to put so much makeup on me, I think I was probably suited to to Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, but I, I did my best. I gave everything that I could with the uh, talent that God has given me to be a girl. And after the final <laughs> performance of Oklahoma, I overheard this teacher saying, and muttering to another teacher, that I was categorically the ugliest girl they'd ever had <laughs> in any play. In 30 years worth of plays, I realized this is not my calling. So I decided I was going to become a tenor instead of a treble, and I Carry on with music, and music uh, was a big part of my life in school and continues uh, to this day. I've you know, always had an interest in that. And I always encourage young people who've had interests in school. You know, when you grow up and you leave school and you've got this freedom now to study whatever you like and do whatever you like, uh, not to forsake some of those simple things you know, <coughs> art, photography, video, all, all the arts that I'm sure that you enjoyed when you were growing up. Because when you leave school and you get a real job, it gets pretty tough and stressful sometimes. And some of the things that you learned in school, especially music, uh, can really be therapeutic for you when times get tough. Because life will throw some curveballs at you. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Well, I had some curveballs. I ended up leaving school at the age of uh, 18 after a couple of meanderings <coughs> between what I wanted to do. I, I was going to be a singer at one stage, a scout had come up in the UK, he liked my voice, and then I was going to be an athlete, but my cricket athletic coach had left, and my cricket coach came and convinced me to play cricket. So within the space of about two years, I ended up being picked to play for Zimbabwe. I was 18 years old, I was fresh-faced, straight out of school. Uh, how old are you guys? Uh, I know some guys are doing their second, third year here, but are there any 19-year-olds here? A few? 20? 21? Any mature students? Okay. If I haven't called you age, I don't feel bad. I mean, um, but I, I basically made my debut against Pakistan. How many of you have heard of Pakistan? <laughs> I mean the country, I mean the team. <laughs> yeah, they're a very controversial team, are they not? Yeah? Sometimes they overstep them up. But anyway, um, I was picked to play against the side, and I was the first black player to ever play for Zimbabwe. So you can imagine what it felt like walking into that changing room. Only black player in the room. I mean, I, only dark face. I, mean, I felt so exposed. I went outside and looked at the whole crowd was white. Can you believe it? I was like, whoa, I'm just a fish out of water here. I looked at the upper part, both of them they were white. But the groundsman who was rolling, he was white. So you can imagine my relief when the Pakistan team walked out. <laughs> and they come. So I, I felt like a fish out of water. I was nervous. I was sweating. Uh, and then I was given the ball to ball. Now, I am one of those people who's got a bit of a quirk. I'm, I'm a very erratic bowler. Have you ever seen... I mean, who's watched cricket yet? I mean, do, you, do you have a team you played for? Or, you know, watched cricket, family member who played, that sort of thing? Boyfriend who played, girlfriend who played, that sort of thing? Well, I... I, I wasn't very accurate. Um, <laughs> I was told that I, I was so bad that I didn't know where the ball was going. I've always tried to be positive in life, so I thought to myself, if I don't know where the ball's going, how's the best one going to know, right? So, <laughs> that's a hint for anyone who's really bad and inaccurate like me. But you can imagine, with this really bad track record of inaccuracy, that everyone was waiting with bated breath for my first delivery. And guess what my first delivery was? And four wives down the leg. This is how I announced my arrival in Test Cricket. 
was rubbish down the lake. And then I went on to uh, get a wicket with my third delivery. Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? Third delivery on wicket. Uh, and then uh, it was all to go pear shaped after that. Because I was called for throwing. Um, do you know what throwing is? Can I demonstrate it? Right. Th this here is a legal delivery, right? My arm's coming over nice and straight. Can you see that? I'll do it in slow motion. Are you ready? Can you see? <laughs> <laughs> right? And this is an illegal action. Because my arm is going from a bent position to a straight position. Now that is technically illegal. That makes you come from Pakistan and Sri Lanka, of course, in which case it doesn't matter. But <laughs> <laughs> you've heard of controversial, haven't you? Right. So, um, so basically, I then had to, uh, after this match, which we won, incidentally, had nothing to do with me. Andy Flower, who knows Andy Flower? Coach of the English side, he made a fantastic 150 odds. His uh, brother made the double century, we made 500 runs and bowled him out twice. <coughs> so we won our first test match ever. After we uh, attained test status, we had it for a couple of years. And then uh, I had to go and do some remedial work on my actions. So I had to go all over the world. I went to India, I worked with Dennis Lilly. You guys know Dennis Lilly? Some of you must. If you know your cricket, you'll know he's a legend. Played for Australia in the 70s and 80s and uh, worked with him and Rod Marsh and Joel Garn and a few others, Clive Rice in South Africa, in Johannesburg, at the Rams of Hikong University. And uh, had a great time. So in three years, I went to India, and then I went to Australia, <coughs> and then I went to South Africa, and I was able to remold and reshape my action and it became legal. Then I played for another five or so years after that. So eight or so seasons in total was my career. It was okay. We had uh, ups and downs, of course, as you do as professional sportsman, and uh, uh, I had some pretty decent performances, but the majority of the time we got hammered, because we weren't, we weren't strong sides. But all in all, eight or so season, then it ended. I did this political protest with Mr. Flower, uh, wore black armbands to mourn the death of democracy, and also uh, to basically disagree with what was happening in the country, politically, economically, etc. Long story short, and I have a really long story, and, and I've written my book, and if you're really interested, it's written, so go buy it on Amazon for five quid. But I, I, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to tell you, basically, that while we have issues of corruption, human rights abuses, people killed in the 80s, uh, I'm talking about corruption in the, in the 90s, where ministers were importing cars at government's expense and then selling them off and keeping the profits. That's what it And it was big scandals all the time, constant scandals. In the late 90s, we got involved in a war in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, it was costing us a million US dollars a month to be there, at its peak, three million. Uh, for a country like Zimbabwe, we just couldn't afford that. And then we had uh, these farm invasions which happened uh, soon after Mugabe asked for a referendum, and the country overwhelmingly voted against it, and he got mad and allowed these war veterans to go and invade farms. And then, long story short, people got killed, people lost their livelihoods, etc., etc. I won't go to the politics of it, you can do your own research, it's out there in the public domain, just uh, type in in Google or Wikipedia, if you can trust it, and do some research, and you find out all you need to about that very turbulent time in our country. But now, here I am, I'm an international cricket I've been playing for a number of years, done all right for the country, and my conscience is pricked. What is this all about? Why are we fighting each other? Why are we almost at war in a time of peace? And it got me thinking, Long story short, I decided to do this protest with Andrew where we wrote a statement and wore the symbol of the morning of death of, the death of democracy and we did that in the World Cup of 2003. First match at Zimbabwe we played against Libya and uh, it cost me everything. Did I know it at the time? Probably not. But I felt that something needed to be said and done. You'll probably find that that happens in your own life. You, you, you disagree with something strongly. And you've got a choice, either speak out, say something, or you just stay in the shadows, stay in the background, because perhaps it doesn't affect you directly. Well, I, when I was growing up, I'd been given a moral standard from many sources. Um, some, some of them were like songs we sung in school. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one, if you don't mind. I'm not going to sing it, I'm just going to uh, recite it. That got me thinking, got me thinking spiritually. It didn't get me thinking mentally, but me really thinking in the deepest recesses of who I am, what kind of person do I want to be, how do I want to live, what kind of legacy will I leave, leave behind when, I, when I'm gone. And, and the, the song is called Fill the World of Love, and it's a song from a film called Goodbye Mr. Chips, a bizarre film, done in the 40s, 50s, I can't even remember, I don't know. But it goes like this, in the morning of my life, I shall look to the sunrise, 
at a moment in my life when the world is new. And the blessing I shall ask is that God will grant me to be brave and strong and true, and to fill the world with love my whole life through. And then you sing it for us, and to fill the world with love, and etc. Et Second verse. In the noontime of my life, which I suppose is where you guys are at. Yeah? Would you say that? Noontime, maybe? Late morning, okay. <laughs> in the noontime of my life, I shall look to the sunshine. At a moment in my life, the sky is blue. And the blessing I shall ask will remain unchanging, to be brave and strong and true, and to fill the world with love my whole life through. In the evening of my life, I shall look to the sunset. At a moment in my life, when the night is due, and the question I shall ask, only I can answer, was I brave and strong and true? Did I fill the world with love my whole life through? I also had a Christian influence, of course, it's been alluded to. We used to go to church every Sunday, it was really boring, I have to say. It was kind of, no offense to anyone, but it was the Church of England, kind of, you know, very, very religious. And there was a guy at the front, you know, a priest, really, Incense and all that. He said, in fact, we, once in a while we do a thing called Even Song. Have you heard of Even Song? And, and he, would, he would sort of do stuff like this. He sat in front and go, Now let us thou my sounds depart in peace. And then the whole school would go, According to thy word. And he would say, For my hands I've seen thy salvation. And they always had the little bounce. You know the little priest bounce? Have you ever seen them? <laughs> Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. <laughs> <laughs> then you knelt, and then you kneelers, and you got up, and then you read, and then you prayed. Listen, nothing wrong with that. And I actually am very grateful that I had a spiritual input in my life that gave me time to think, time to reflect. Obviously, later on, I realized I had a preference to worship God in a different way, it makes that kind of worship no less valid. It just wasn't my thing. But over the years, there were messages that stuck. Messages that challenged me to live a different way, to think a different way. Messages that challenged me on questions that we all ask. Questions of existence, where do we come from? Questions of purpose, why are we here? Questions of life after death, where do we go? Yeah, they touched on all of those issues. And I'm sure as a young person growing up in secular modern Britain, I'm sure at some point they crossed your mind. Where did we come from? Actually, think about it. Come on. Did you, did you honestly think that billions of years ago nothing exploded? Yeah? Do you? I mean, I, I know that a lot of you have to believe that because that's what you study. But in your heart of hearts, in your heart of hearts, when you look around at the elegance of everything that we call nature, the artistry behind it all, the scale of it, how vast it is, we don't know how many stars there are, planets. Pieces of space debris out there, we just, we couldn't number them. It's so vast. It's, it's so bizarrely expansive. I don't know, is there an end to the universe? Who knows? You look at the human body and it's a, an amazing thing. It really is. It can reproduce, it can feed itself, it can repair itself. The human cell, just one cell, of the trillions of cells that are in your body, is a factory. I remember my, I did A-level, uh, what do you call advanced GCSEs, uh, and I remember the intricacy of, of just looking at some things like the mitochondria and then the, the DNA molecule and the information that's in there. Wow. The elementary canal, the immune system, amazing. Not trivial. It always struck me how hard it is to keep a human alive. Have you thought about that? Uh, just. How you gotta eat, yeah? A few days without food, you're dead. Uh, some of you who are a bit more rotund, maybe a few weeks, but you know. <laughs> a few days without water, you're gone. A few minutes without breath, and you're dead. It's hard enough to keep a human alive, how <coughs> much more difficult is it to start the whole thing up? Do you think it's trivial that life could come from non-life? You can get all the chemicals you want, put them all in a nice lump, and you're still not going to have a human being. 
So life isn't trivial. It is infinitely complex. I mean, the mind boggles. You guys, someone once said to me that university is studying more and more about less and less. Is that true? <laughs> Yeah, you guys specialize. There's some people who I was thinking about this the other day. There's some people who just study hands. <laughs> I broke my wrist when I was a cricketer in '96. We were playing a cricket match against England. I dived on my hand and it was broken. I didn't know it was broken for like six months. But I, I thought it was a bad sprain. And anyway, it got checked out. You got a crack. You need a, a bone graft. You need an operation. Then I had this big operation, and there was a guy called Doctor Bidolf. And he was like 60 years old and he drove a Porsche. It was just in insane. But I met the guy and he, he basically told me that he's a hand specialist. That's all he does. Hands. The man has studied all his life on hands. <laughs> Some of you are just going to study eyes. Some of you just the nose. <laughs> That's not nose, ear, nose and throat specialist. But you know what I mean, right? But, but isn't it amazing that there's just so much that's there? It's just so complicated that one person in a lifetime can major in on one part of the human body. Symbiosis, animals, insects, plants needing each other. I mean, how do you explain those things? The, the perfect balance of everything, just the fact that we're just the right distance from the sun, just a little closer to be too hot, a little further too cold, Gases in the atmosphere are just right. Everything's just just right for life. I, I mean, has that crossed your mind as amazing? It crossed my mind when I was a kid growing up. It just seemed too coincidental that everything just was so perfectly balanced. So, I've got, a, I've got a quandary already. I mean, this is a foundational issue. Do you believe in God or do you not? And the majority of us find that we get that fork in the road at some point. We make our choice. We set our stall out. We play our cards. And from then on, we know the decision we've made about God is going to govern the way we live. Because if we believe He exists, we live one way. If we believe He doesn't, we live another. And I was at that age when all my friends were starting to get up to no good. You know what I'm talking about? Drinking a little. Smoking a little. Drugs. Sex. Getting into stuff they shouldn't have been getting involved in. At such, such, such a young age, I mean, it was 13, 14. So I knew I was faced with a decision. I'm going to go along with them, you know, I want to live a life that has God in it, or don't I? And so I went to the spiritual quest. You know, I didn't want the God of the Bible to be the answer for me. I'll be honest about that. Because I knew it would change the way I lived. I mean, some, some of us are like that. We, we know that if we embrace that maybe there is a God out there, maybe we've lived wrong. And we know that we can't live that way anymore if we're to embrace the concept of a holy God who is righteous, who must judge. Who, yes, He loves us and He's demonstrated that through Jesus, but uh, maybe you like the sin. Maybe you like having fun. Maybe you like your parties and binge drinking. If you believe in God and He doesn't like that kind of lifestyle, you know, oh, maybe I'll stop doing some of those things. So I didn't know what to do. And you know what I did? I went for an alternative. I went for yoga. How many of you guys have heard of yoga? Yeah, that's like African kid going for yoga. I don't know how I did it, but I did. Okay. <laughs> now, my biggest problem was I couldn't sit in the lotus position. You guys know what the lotus position is, right? You know, I mean, I can't even dance. <coughs> you know the one where you cross your legs and you sit like that? You've probably seen the pictures. I was rubbish at that. But I thought, you know, I'm not really after the physical stuff anyway. It's the mental sort of spiritual sort of elevation and opening my mind. So I, I got on the transcendental meditation side of things. I wanted to be spiritually elevated. So the first thing I did was I bought a book. Because I mean, that's what you do, isn't it? It's more than you buy a book. And the book was called Teach Yourself Yoga. And uh, the first chapter had like three exercises you're supposed to do. Very basic preliminary sort of pre preparation to spur you on. Exercise number one, imagine an apple. Okay, pretty easy. I imagine an apple. So I imagine that. Exercise two, this is about a week later you're supposed to do it. <laughs> Imagine you're sitting in an apple. Okay? <laughs> Exercise three, and there's a Greek word for it, uh, baloney. Um, <laughs> Imagine that you become an apple, right? So I kind of figured out, okay, listen, I'm looking for truth. I'm looking for spiritual truth. So why don't I look in the one place that I haven't looked in? I mean, it just makes sense, doesn't it? If I was to ask you guys, how much 
knowledge do you have from the sum total of all knowledge that exists? What would you say? So let's put all knowledge in a pot. Of that, how much do you think you know? Uh, I'll be generous. Uh, 2%. Thank you. I don't know about you. Yeah, you guys are university students. Let's say 10%. Okay, really, really clever. Uh, and of course, the really bright people in the world, maybe I'll give them 50, if I'm generous. Yeah. I think that's fair. There's so much we don't know. What, what, what would it, I suppose, what would be so wrong with considering that the one thing that I'm not considering could be the answer? As in, why couldn't the answer be Jesus, God? So I went on a Christian youth camp, and a couple of mates have been pestering me. They've been pestering me for years. If you're the kind of person who does that, I'm sure some of you be pestered. Yeah, the guys, come on, give God a chance. Come on. Like, yeah, they're not interested. Come on. And I kept, he kept that. So after a while, I realized, okay, let me go to camp. And you know, the reason I went was because they always came back with these big beaming smiles on their faces. And it, it annoyed me, because they were always happy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if you're like that. If, you, if you've got Christian buddies and you're not a Christian, and they, they're constantly on your case, and you can just see there's something different about them, yeah? They seem to have a peace about them. They, they go through trouble, they go through testing, stresses, they're a lot better than you do. And they just seem to have a togetherness about them. Yeah, well, that's what my mates were like. And I admired them for it. I wouldn't have told them privately or in public, but, but I did. I saw something in them that I didn't have, and I wanted it. So I went to the Christian Youth Camp and we had a lot of fun and games and then on the penultimate night of the camp, it was only about five days, I heard the gospel message. And I'm sure you've heard it at some point in your lives. Certainly in the West, it's not something that is hidden from you. You've probably heard it in its different guises, even if it's been shrouded by someone who doesn't really believe in it. But it goes something like this. Yes, God made us. And uh, he made us very much in the beginning through making Adam and Eve, who were the first people who existed, and then they fell from grace. They disobeyed God, which is really a tendency that every single one of us have, a tendency to rebel. We don't want to be told what to do, we want to live our lives the way we want to live them, and who said rules weren't for breaking? So the 60s ushered in a period where everyone is just a rebel, anti-establishment, anarchy, and all the sort of stuff, loot shops, you name it. But we've all become rebellious, and it's because it's innate to us, it's part of our nature. It's called the sin nature, really, and it's not something you can just get out of you. It's a problem, actually, because God is just, and he must punish sin. Uh, I suppose we are just, in a sense, ourselves, aren't we? We see wrongdoing in life, and it makes us mad. Joe Yates, yeah? She was from around here, wasn't she? Actually, um, I've got a friend who's a teacher, a former teacher of mine in Plumtree, who teaches at Bristol Grammar School. He took me to the spot where she was found. Because I come to play a cricket match, and the cricket match was right by the place, close to where she was dumped. And most of us run to the killer court, am I right? Yeah. It's like, it would be so wrong if they had caught him red handed, <coughs> and on some technicality he got off. I, I, I don't know about you, but that would be, a, we would sense that's unjust. And we are evil. How much more God desiring justice? You do the crime, you do the time. You break his commands, there's a consequence. So I have no problem believing that. I never had a problem understanding that I have failed, I have sinned, I have broken commands and overstepped the mark because I got beaten six of the best ones in school, but okay, twice. You know what that is, don't you? Six of the best is uh, when you get caned. Corporal punishment. You guys don't have it in this country anymore, and I suspect that if you had it, a lot of those looters wouldn't be looting. Uh, but it's, it's getting caned. You get, you get whacked on the bum, and it's quite sore. And um, you get these marks which stay there for a few days as well. But trust me, you will not do what got you beaten again. <laughs> uh, and uh, this was something that I'd been beaten. I, I don't know what I did. I can't even remember. But I must have done something wrong, obviously, to get the maximum. I must have sworn or, or done something silly. And so I knew I'm not a goody two shoes. I don't know about you. Maybe you think you're a goody two shoes. And you, you're not such a bad person. You give money to charity and all that sort of stuff. And because of that, you, you think, well, if there is a God and there is a heaven, he'll let me in because I'm not so bad. And that's kind of how I felt. And that was to be. I suppose smash. Because I heard through the guy who was speaking in the front that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Every single one of us have messed up. At least once. And once is enough to disqualify. What am I talking about? Well, let me let me just back. Let me rewind a little. And just 
go back to the three questions of box. Where did we come from? I just proposed to you, perhaps, we came from God. Second question, what is my purpose in life? I would suggest that my purpose in life is to not only discover this God, but to live a life that pleases Him. And to live a life that pleases Him means many things. It doesn't mean just avoiding wrongdoing and being a goody two-shoes the rest of your life. No. But it means doing certain things that He thinks are important as well. Uh, becoming holy, all those things. They're very, very uh, important Mainly that you have a love relationship with your creator. But finally, this question of where I go when I die is probably the most important. And this man addressed that. Because ultimately, your sin means that you deserve eternal separation from God. Eternal damnation. Some people don't believe in it these days. They think it's politically incorrect to frighten little girls and boys of that place called hell. But sadly, you know, this man Jesus, who is, can be verified in history, you can find... References to this man, Josephus, a historian, wrote about this Jesus who was crucified. There are many prophecies in the Bible about this coming Messiah, and they were fulfilled. He's a man who was really born into a place called Bethlehem. You can find Bethlehem <coughs> there. So the accurate biblical account, I think, is verifiable. It's not some fairy tale, it's not a myth. And so this man, Jesus, dies on a cross to purchase a couple of things for us. Salvation, of course, through the forgiveness of sins, through his blood, and also the opportunity to live forever in a place that's going to be absolutely incredible. You take everything that's good about God, you magnify it, and you put it in a place called heaven, and you take out all the bad in this earth. No pain, no death, no sadness, no aging, which means no Botox, no liposuction, no tummy tuck. Yeah? Eternal youth, eternal bliss. You'll live forever. In a place where there's no night, no crime. You'll see your loved ones, those who've gone before you. And I kind of got that. I, I, I was like, yeah, why wouldn't I want that? So I was asking, what do I do next? And of course, I was led through how you become a Christian. And it begins with a small step of faith to actually embrace the fact that we could be a God. That he has revealed himself not only through the creation, but through the Bible, through eyewitness accounts of people who've been touched by him, whose lives have been changed by him, transformed. And then you invited him, and so I did. I invited God into my heart, into my life. And I've been a Christian now for almost 20 years. I want to tell you, I've had some hairy experiences even after becoming a Christian. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden your life sort of pans out very well. I've almost been killed four times uh, in, in various. <laughs> Uh, experiences, I, some of them self-inflicted. I was drowned in Sri Lanka when I was caught up in a rip tide. I got carjacked once, and then after two hours, I think it was going to kill me. But threatened by the government, would have killed me, so I took leaves and all it, but suddenly ended up settling in this country in 2003. And I almost got kidnapped in Spain when I was a young kid as well. Uh, so who knows? I mean, I could possibly be not here today if it wasn't the providence of God. And of course, again, I've documented all those neat details in the story of my life, and I haven't got time to go into them now. But I can tell you this, that throughout my life, my belief in God has satisfied the deepest needs of my humanity as a person. When I strip all the stuff away, all the achievements in sport, all the, I suppose, goals I wanted to achieve when I was your age, all the, when you take it all away, you're just on your own in your room by yourself, thinking, what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Where am I going? When I've stripped it all away, I can tell you now that I have found the answer in this being, this man called Jesus Christ, who was God in human flesh. It changed my life. I, it gave me a reason to live that went beyond sport and achievement. Because trust me, you can have it all. We know that only too well. Whitney had it all. She had money. She had fame. She had adulation from one, you know, wonderful crowd. They, they came to watch her. In droves. Okay, she wasn't her best towards the end, but trust me, somewhere along the line she's been sold a lot. That it wasn't enough. She wanted more. Turned to drugs. I don't know what was tormenting her, but there was a hole in her life. And it couldn't only be satisfied, I'm telling you, by spiritual things. Not material, not soulish, but spiritual things. I almost feel like I need to just wrap it up and take some questions now. 
But let me just leave you with that thought. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to a break or... Uh, no, we'll take questions and then... Okay. And then Sounds good to me. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to leave that with you. <coughs> Consider what the meaning of it all is because there's just far too many people who've had it all and have no integrity in what they do. Um, let's look at some sportsmen. Hey, last year was a wonderful year for sportsmen, wasn't it? <laughs> and the year before. <laughs> Terry Henry, little handball, remember that? <laughs> and uh, John Terry, sleeping with his teammate's girlfriend. Uh, what, Wayne Rooney? Didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah. Ryan Giggs! <laughs> Woo! Tiger Woods! <laughs> That's scandal after scandal. Why? Because these people had no spiritual depth. <coughs> they had no integrity. They had no barometer for morality. Where does it come from if you just evolved from monkeys? If you're just a higher life form, you might as well go for it, just like Mugabe. Just like Hitler. Survival of the fittest, baby. And when you die, hmm, no judgment. None in the face, because we just get extinguished. Now, that's one way to live. Where are the people who are going to make things right in this broken world? Where are the lawyers hmm, sat here who are going to say enough to this or enough to that? I'm going to do things right. I'm going to be honest. I'm not just going to go for as much as I can get. It starts with some kind of moral compass. And that moral compass, trust me, I don't believe can exist without a lawgiver who is greater than our situation, who is greater than our world. And all our relative choices. It was good for you, not for me, though. And what God says, this is right, this is wrong. Live this way, because it's right, and don't live that way. Hokey gokey, let's take some questions. <laughs> yes, sir, at the back, with the green hand. No, black. Uh, Doc. Do you not think people might be able to have that moral compass in their life without God? Oh, yeah, of course. You, I mean, we, we do have a general sort of sense of right and wrong, don't we? I mean, I've got a little daughter, and we've got to teach her that it's wrong to put her hand in the fire. You know what I mean? It's like, there's certain things we'll teach her, like, uh, you know, learn to share. And of course, that's just part of the human nature that we've had that's been passed down through generations that doesn't necessarily have a spiritual foundation. Can secular people, atheists, humanists, naturalists, have it? Yes. Of course, because we know what's decent and right in a general sort of way. I suppose, I'm like saying your foundation has to come from somewhere. And if you believe that we're higher animals, then why can't we act like them? I mean, why can't I just act like an, an animal? We, we know it's wrong to act like highly evolved animals, because animals act differently to human beings. Animals can eat each other, and it's not a problem. If I ate you, I, mean, I go to jail for cannibalism, you know, it's just not right. I was at a place last night with, uh, they had a dog called Zach. I mean, this dog made a lot of noise, but Zach, Zach, he, he's, he's an animal, right? So, if Zach goes and has babies with the dog next door, right, without asking, that's, that's, he's an animal, yeah? He doesn't have to ask. Human beings, no, <laughs> hold on. Yeah? We're different. We're not like animals. It's not survival of the fittest for us. Because if you live that way, you'll be ruthless. Trust me. Uh, you want to get to the top of the corporate ladder, it doesn't matter who you step on. I'm on my way up, buddy. And the only thing that tempers that, I believe, is the God of the Bible. Because he comes in and says very different things to what the world is saying. He says things like, turn the other cheek. Are you serious? <laughs> he says, walk the extra mile. He says, someone asks you for your jacket, give me your coat as well. Very different. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hate you. What a different way of doing things. I don't think, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, I'm not making a definitive statement that you have to believe in the God of the Bible to have those values, because we do know that many religions, and many religions borrow from others, and but ultimately, what I'm saying is, I believe the God of the Bible is the one true God. I'm unashamed in saying that. I've been quoted as saying that. And of course, you might disagree with that. But ultimately, he has revealed to the world what his heart is, how we ought to treat each other. He's given us rules that are supposed to protect. 
See, for example, the Ten Commandments are not there uh, as a fabrication of man. They're given from a higher order. God knows this is how society can function. The society needs to function well if you follow these rules, like obey your parents. I mean, it's a simple one, isn't it? Hmm? Honor your parents. How many kids honor their parents nowadays? Now, most of the time, I, sometimes I visit homes, I travel, do I, about a hundred and something of these a year, and I, I watch. I watch how kids treat, treat their parents. <coughs> Disrespect! See how they treat their teachers. But that moral code comes to mind. Now, some people might say, well, it doesn't. Thou shalt not murder. Where's that from? Thou shalt not commit adultery. So, hey, I think those values come from a pure God who knows best, and he's handed them down to us. And I think they're the cornerstone of society because they enable society to function correctly. Uh, now, I, in fact, the family I stayed with last night, daughter's pregnant, <coughs> uh, the friends came over, that was, daughter was pregnant at the age of 19, the father's nowhere to be known, nobody to be seen, he's, he's disappeared. Um, she's living in a council flat, got a new boyfriend, other daughter living with boyfriend, uh, soon to get pregnant. Uh, just, just crazy. Uh, you, you guys might say, well, actually society has changed, it's so old fashioned, da, da, da. Maybe you might think that, but I think the God of the Bible has revealed the way we ought to live, treat each other, and also treat ourselves. And I don't think I can find that in, in humanistic sort of philosophies and other ways of looking at the world. But that's my personal opinion. You might disagree, in which case you can come back. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir? Uh, knowing what you know now and the consequences and penalties you face after wearing the black armband in 2003, would you do the same again now? Yeah. Hey, that's a great question. I always get asked that one. Um, obviously, <laughs> um, <coughs> The path you choose in life will be littered with little choices that come along. Um, little ones that d determine where you, your life will end up going. And they, there's always a consequence to the choice, uh, positive or negative. And, and for me, I weighed up what the potential fallout was. Uh, I could lose my job, my career, cricket. Um, I could perhaps leave the country. I was aware that I could die. I didn't want to die, but, but I was aware of the fact that that was possibly a penalty I'd have to consider. And ultimately I had to pay that price. But calling it regret I think is a bit of a strong term, and I'll explain it with an analogy that might not make any sense to you guys, because I don't think any of your parents. Are any of your parents here, by the way? Excluding some of the people who are visiting, but, but I, I didn't think so. But if, if you're a parent, and you're a little baby, child, boy, girl, whatever, well, I don't think there's anything in between, but either boy or girl, right? <laughs> um, you realize that that child's going to change your life. You make a decision, we're going to have a baby. Now, my wife and I planned our baby. Sometimes it's not planned, but, but we wanted our baby. And we were going to shower that baby with love from the day that baby was conceived. And when you have your baby, you will understand that it changes your life. <laughs> Crying at night every two hours, waking up, wanting to get fed. Nappies need changing. Uh, just, just got to constantly follow the baby to make sure the baby doesn't hurt itself, etc. And it changes your life. And in that instance, when you when you realize your life has changed, it's not the life I had. My life is completely in a different direction. My focus is in a different place. Do I have regret? I would say absolutely not. Uh, it's cost me. I've had to make sacrifices. Uh, I have to change the way I do things on a daily basis. But I love it, because my child, of course, uh, not only responds to me, showers me with love, I shower her with love, it's a reciprocal relationship, and in the end I would say my life is richer for it. So my life is richer for having made the protest, because I proved a few things to myself. One, I felt in my heart this was the right thing to do, and there's a bit of a story behind that, I won't go into it, but I'll just summarize it by saying I felt that uh, the Lord had placed in my heart a desire to do this protest. It wasn't, didn't just come out of a vacuum. I, I, don't think anyone just wakes up one day thinking I'll just throw my career away by doing some protest against the government, uh, especially uh, totalitarian sort of tyrannical government. I'll get that. Um, 
So, yes, change my life cost me a lot. Uh, regrets, no. But do I ever, does that mean I never look back and longingly sort of think about Zimbabwe with nostalgia? No, of course I remember my friends. A lot of them have left. I remember the sun. <laughs> and, and just so many things that I miss. But, but I've got no complaints. And I know that it's not forever. And I'm making the most of now. Sorry, I give a long answers. Next. <laughs> yes, ma'am. being open to this charity. Because I know like with some guys there's there's a bit of an ego issue there, especially with like accepting that Jesus You know what basically got me over the line one what, what what initially got me thinking about maybe Jesus being real? Being the only Am I phrasing that correctly? Well you know it's <laughs> hey, I'm a blow. We've got multitask. <laughs> One question. First question. First question. Okay, what is it that made you decide to say I'm going for it now? Well, if you want me to be honest, I was terrified to go to hell. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's the only reason I, 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 I became a Christian, because that makes people think, well, you're just scared to go to hell, that's why you believe in God. But I think it's healthy to understand that there are consequences for living a life that defies God. And Jesus warned us many times in the scriptures about this place, and you don't want to go there. In fact, he tells us a story called Lazarus and the Rich Man. I call it a story, I don't call it a parable, because there may be truth to it, it may have actually happened. There was a rich man, and there was a guy called Lazarus, and the rich man, of course, lived in a nice palatial sort of uh, home, and, and there was a guy called Lazarus, who was a poor guy, and he used to live outside, and, you know, the dog used to lick his wounds, and he used to beg for crumbs from the rich man's table, and the rich man wasn't interested. The rich man dies, and Lazarus dies. Rich man goes to a place called hell, uh, called Hades in the Bible, it's called the, the gathering place of dead people. And then um, Lazarus is with Abraham in a place where it seems like it's much better, there's peace and I wouldn't call it heaven, but, but it's a better place. And this rich man is in hell and he's in torment, the Bible says. And he's feeling agony. And he says to uh, Father Abraham, he says, can you get Lazarus to dip his finger in water and put on my tongue. He's, I, I'm in agony in this flame. And then he says something bizarre. He says, uh, Abraham says, no, there's this big gap between us. I'm sorry, I can't come to you, you can't come to us. It's, it's, it's a chasm, sorry. He says, well, at least, okay, please, can you go back to earth to tell my relatives, basically, that they must avoid coming to this place. Abraham says to him, sorry, you know, if they can't believe with the prophets and Moses. They won't believe if someone goes back from the dead. But the thing to pull from that story is here was a man who had his memories. He remembered earth. He was conscious. He wasn't extinguished from existence. He felt pain and agony. And it's actually true that we are body, soul and spirit and our spirit continues to live on. I'm sure some of you in the medical fraternity have heard of the near-death experience where people are brain dead and their hearts have stopped beating but they're still conscious. Like there's a story of a blind lady who uh, died. She'd been blind from birth, never seen anything. She dies in a car crash. Well, she, she has a car crash. She's in the operating theater and uh, she dies on the operating table. And then she, uh, obviously all the, 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 the vital signs are gone. There's, n there's no life. She hovers above her body and she goes to a place. But just before she goes to a place, whatever it is, whatever it is, she sees um, her wedding ring. She sees that they cut a, uh, shaved her head to cut a hole to release the pressure. She sees the time on a clock. She hears a conversation. Uh, and then a few minutes later, she's back in her body. She's alive. They resuscitate her. And she relays all this to the doctors. And of course, they were people who just had no belief that there's consciousness after death. So they rationalized and said, no, no, no. You can't be. But they, they couldn't really argue. Blind person seeing, remembering when they're supposed to be dead, brain dead. It didn't make sense to them. It makes sense to me because I believe the, the part of you that's really you, your spirit, lives on and it's going to have a destination. <laughs> it's either going to go to God, heaven, if we can call it that, or it's going to go to a place called hell. And this place is not described as a place that's nice. It's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's described as a place where the worm doesn't die. 
It's a place of utter corruption. It's like a garbage dump. Everything that's bad collected to be in one place because it can't go into heaven. It's like the garbage. You just take out, you put the garbage outside. And I'm sorry that it's such a crass sort of description, but when I heard of hell, and then I heard of heaven, I thought, oh, I'd be an idiot not to want to opt for heaven because it's so much better. It offers so much. First of all, it offers forgiveness of sins. I mean, I don't know, if I, I don't know about you, but I don't know if you've ever hurt someone in life. I've hurt a few people, I've done a few things, said a few things to people that I'm ashamed of. I look back on my life and I go, man, if I had a second chance, I wouldn't have done that. There are people I've offended to the point where I can't talk to them. They don't talk to me. I don't know if you're like that. I don't know if you, maybe you're so good that you've never done that, but I, I've messed up. And, and I know what it is to need forgiveness. I know what it is. I've been married now eight years, and I know what it's like to fight with my wife and we can't talk. Hmm? When sitting next to each other, but there's this invisible wall separates, we're miles apart. And I know what it's like needing to hear, it's okay, I forgive you. And I wanted that from God because I knew I was wrong. I knew I defended God. But this incentive, the, the most wonderful incentive to become a Christian ultimately, is that the creator of the universe wanted it. The being that made it all, bigger than everything that we can imagine, is interested in me and you. In spite of everything you've done, hmm? he knows it, actually. He knows everything you've done, everything you did in private, in secret, in the dark, that you thought no one was watching. He knows it. In spite of that, he still loves you, he still wants you. To me, that was too compelling to turn down. I mean, the create. I, mean, I, I don't know about you, but if the queen invited you over coffee, yeah, you wouldn't say no. Sorry, I'm too busy today, would you? You'd be like, I, I'm right. I'm right. Right in there. The creator of the universe, who's no disrespect to the queen, greater than her, greater than all kings and queens who have been, is called the King of Kings, is interested in you, and he wants you to know that. And he let me know through a person who spoke to me at the front, just like today. So I'm telling you guys. Creator of the universe is interested in me. Second question. No, I think you answered the game in my story, actually. Um, Next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple more. How are we doing for time? We don't have a couple of time. But we'll, we'll look to wind it up now, shall we? Yeah. Were there any other Christians in the Zimbabwe team who supports you in? Um, yeah, I, there, there was a guy called Gavin Rennie, another guy called Raymond Price. He actually still plays for the national side at the stage in time. Uh, and um, I don't know any more. I think there were, those are the three I knew of who were very vocal and upfront about it. Um, but the rest of them, I, I don't know if you're a genuine Christian. You can't tell if I'm a genuine Christian. It really is. It's only the way I live and what comes out of my mouth, I suppose. And I'm telling you I'm a Christian, but unless someone tells me and lives it, I, I guess I, I, I'm, I, I'm ignorant. So I, I don't think any of the other guys were. I certainly get asked if Andy Flower was, and I asked him point blank once, and he said no, but I, I could be wrong. I know his parents are Christians, but that doesn't count for anything with regards to his personal relationship with God. So probably not. I, I can't add to that. I just think, think those two guys, Raymond Price and the guy called... Gavin Rennie. Cool? Okay. Well, thank you for listening. Um, I have gone over a little. I was given 45 minutes, but I went over a little. <laughs>